So hi everyone. We have uh, all the speakers that for for this uh, malware track this morning, which was great. Uh, we got very interesting presentations from all around, um, covering different subjects. Um, and we have uh, it shows because we have very good questions on on Slido. Um, you can still uh, add yours if you want, or vote for the one that you would we would like us to discuss. Um, so I'm going to go uh, with the, the specific like uh, uh, questions for the specific uh, uh, topic or um, presentations first, and then we can have like broader uh, discussion with questions that everyone can answer. Um, so I'm going to go in the order of the presentation. Uh, so we have a good one from. Um, uh, well, all questions are anonymous, but we have a good one for um, the first presentation uh, about the, just give me a second, here, um, the Cashmere uh, Black botnet. Um, so did the Cashmere Black bots have some, some kind of internal kill switch uh, that can be abused for uh, takedown? Uh, in other words, did you look into ways uh, you could uh, take down the, the botnet? Uh, and does the bot authenticate to the there is some some kind of authentication for the the CNC server? Okay, so I will take this one. Um, actually, there is no actual authentication with the CNC server, but uh, we saw that as part of the communication between the bot and the CNC, there were special headers that um, the bot had to add when he uh, reaches and tried to talk to the CNC. And without those headers, the CNC won't respond. So we can say it's a, it's a sort of a security layer that the attacker added, but it's not a real authentication like we all know, like uh, other authentication mechanisms. Uh, but the, the other question, in uh, the one about the kill switch, um, we're not aware of any kill switch implemented inside the, the infected bots, but but since all, all the bots are in the control of the attacker, it can just connect and do whatever he wants. He is the, like an admin there. So he can do whatever he wishes and, and he can even uh, uh, redefine again the cron tab. So nothing will appear there and, and no one will know that this was indeed an infected bot. And actually, since we don't see any attacks now in our data lakes from bots today, uh, we can, we, we, it, it's possible that the attacker shut down the operation, or maybe uh, due to the, the notifications that we sent to all uh, um, server owners, maybe the owners took manual action and cleaned the servers. So we don't we don't have a specific answer to that. We don't have we we don't know exactly if he has this this code switch, but we can assume that he he might go there and and, and delete it. Hope I answered the, the question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, we have a, a question for uh, David this time. Um, um, the uh, how, how hard would it be to in, uh, intentionally get infected by a bot uh, that gets sold uh, on this market? Um, do you know the success rate for the credentials? And uh, yeah. Yeah, so so um, it seems like there's uh, not that many computers, at least in Canada, being infected. So my guess is that if we were to try and do some sort of honeypot of the sort, uh, we'd have to get a server somewhere else than in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of, in France, it was surprisingly the number of bots that were for sale from France, US as well. And, you know, with the botnet that has, you know, over 350,000 computers officially, at least, um, it wouldn't be all that hard to see exactly um, to get one infected. And then the problem is just finding out or, you know, attracting people and having our bots being sold. Uh, we've seen from the discussions that we've, uh, that we've read that the bots that have access to, for example, uh, commercial bank accounts, they seem to be uh, pretty popular. So populating the bot with the right credentials, and uh, it seems like many knowledge sectors are looking for these. And we know that there's a very big payday if you can get into these accounts. So that would be one way of doing it. 
um, not our line of uh, business, but you know, if someone's interested, I would be very interested in reading the report on that one and seeing exactly what gets exploited uh, among the hundreds of credentials and cookies that you can find on any of these bots. So uh, clearly something that would be interesting and for, uh, for future research uh, for sure. So we have a question also for Sam. Um, uh, they were curious about um, if the vendor uh, patched the vulnerabilities and uh, if schools uh, eventually updated their software. Uh, and if you have an idea of the time frame it took to uh, um, discuss with the, the vendor. Yeah, no problem. So that's always kind of a, a interesting topic. Uh, every time we disclose vulnerabilities to a vendor, it <laughs> can go one of two ways, you know, good or bad. Um, NetOp was one of the good ones. Sometimes people think we're trying to hack them and like, why are you doing this? But uh, NetOp uh, had a disclosure or a responsible disclosure process in place. So once we disclosed them to uh, our each of these vulnerabilities to them, um, our internal uh, McAfee's disclosure process is 90 days. However, if we have good communication and they requested an extension or anything, we usually grant it. It's the people that um, don't respond and then like the last minute be like, oh, can you extend it? That we we, we usually stick to our, our hard 90 days. But um, in the, the terms of this NetApp Vision Pro software, they, they um, got it patched actually pretty quickly and uh, sent us over the the um, the patched version and we, we did some validation on it. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much where our responsibilities end. Um, it, it would be nice if we we did have the bandwidth to reach out to, you know, the infected um, or not infected, uh, the uh, affected um, school districts and stuff that have this software installed. But unfortunately, we don't have that client data um, and we kind of leap that into the NetOps court. Um, but we, we, we try to, in our publications and talks like this, try to highlight on the fact that there is a patch available. And if anyone uh, of you guys are a school admin over there, uh, definitely install the update if you have the software. But um, yeah, we, we don't really control that process too much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. I think yeah. you nailed it. Uh, not not always uh, very smooth, but uh, uh, sure. I think it seems to be really, seems to be taking the uh, making this uh, seems to be very responsible about disclosing these vulnerabilities. Um, so the next question is for our last presenters, um, Warren and Peter. Um, so they are. Uh, other groups like Lazarus and Kimsuki who are uh, fi financially motivated. Um, and, but also, and I'm gonna add uh, allegedly to this question. So allegedly motivated to uh, uh, make money to benefit to the, the North Korean regime. Um, how would you classify between second tier actors and APT in this case? So thank you, thank you for this question. So. Um... When we think about tier one APTs, we don't, because they, well, the main criteria is that they are associated to, directly associated to some kind, some state organization. Uh, and in this case, well, they're in, for, for that reason, the motivation of what they do, it's not really as important as on, on the second, on, on the second tier. We usually, we use the motivation more to distinguish the crimeware groups from the tier two, not necessarily tier two from the tier one. In this case, these two groups are allegedly uh, directly linked to state organizations. So that would make them a tier one uh, groups. Do you want to add something, Warren? If I take myself off mute first, now would help women. <laughs> um, yeah, just with what Fitz was saying, like, Lazarus and Kaminsky have obviously been long, long attributed to North Korea by multiple um, intelligence communities around the world. And most of their attacks are very, very financially motivated in the, the understanding that is to obviously move forward in North Korean regime and, and move forward with what they want to perform. So for us, they would very much be a clear cut first tier APT. They are doing something that directly impacts the, the motivation of their state or the motivation of their, their leadership. 
whereas some of the second tier groups don't necessarily do that because of the overlaps that we tried to describe in our talk. However, there may be a supporting group that obviously back up the likes of Lazarus or Comiskey. Good question. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure. Um, Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I had this, this thing frozen for a for a minute, just at the right moment again. Um, so, uh, so while we are in in this uh, discussion, um, there's a uh, very good question, and I think everyone can jump in and uh, and how and and uh, comment on this. And is how can you assess the motivation of a threat actor if the visibility into their operation is is biased um I, i'm uh, pretty sure that every every time we do some malware research we are biased by our visibility um it, are we perhaps wrong sometimes when we try to, to um, assess or you know confirm their motivation so, so uh I don't know. Do you want to go forward, Warren? <laughs> I do. I was just going to say yes. I think we are. I, I think the the reason that we are sometimes wrong is the the sensationalism that comes with it. Everybody wants to say it's country A, or everybody wants to say it was definitely country B. I mean, a, a prime example that obviously Vitor and I have sort of worked on in Talos was Olympic Destroyer. Olympic Destroyer came out, happened, and there was a paper said it was China. There was a paper said it was Russia. There was a paper said it was someone else. Paper said like it, it all started to come out that way and. I think the problem that we have is, yes, our um, our information is obviously biased to the telemetry that we have as companies. I'm sure Semantic, McAfee, and Imperva, et cetera, have different telemetry that we have at Cisco. And that, that's just the way of the world. That is how it goes. I think what we've got better at doing in the community with some of these bigger attacks is we've got better sharing that information, which I think does help us as a whole be right eventually. That's not to say we're not right first sometimes, because sometimes all of us are, and that is the way it goes. But yeah, there, there's absolutely a, a concern there that needs to be addressed because too often we want to jump in and, and be sensationalist about it. And I think part of that problem also as well is, is some of the journalism that exists in our sector. There's too much journalism that wants to be sensationalist about who they pick and who they select. They don't often care about some of the actual researchers that did the work, i.e. the guys on this talk with us. Uh, they don't actually care about some of the information that they have and, and want to talk about. But in short, yes, um, information is going to be biased to the company carrying out. But yes, we absolutely can be wrong at times. And I think there's an acceptance in the community for that we all try and be right as much as we can. And on that, just that's why that's also a motivation for us to try to make um, uh, this new concept to to actually we are not. So we have we have given a, a few examples, but we're just trying to define to help define a criteria that will help everyone to better um, align and have better answers. And of course, that will always depend on the information that you that, that you have and how you fit into the criteria. But our intention is actually to help to make uh, maybe the lines less blur and have a criteria that will help you to understand the, dif the different groups and how they operate um, within our threat landscape. So separating between crimeware and APT is something we've very well, not very, but it, it's recent. Like it's, it, we've been doing it for maybe ten or fifteen years. When we sort of classify APT and in, in, in crimeware uh, for financially motivated uh, groups, uh, do you think we were wrong to make this uh, kind of classification before? No, not 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 wrong. This classification made sense back when it was first started and makes sense now. What we need, what we are proposing, is that we need to uh, evolve this classification and maybe distinguish within uh, the state, uh, the state-related groups, the ones that that are more related than the others. You know, because there there are groups that are clearly uh, aligned with government organizations, and there are groups that are aligned in the interests, but not necessarily in the government organizations. And that's what we want to distinguish. And this second group. They have certain characteristics that blur more with the crimeware than the first one, um, and that's that's with 
it's not a single criteria. That's why it's not a single criteria. You need to have several things to help you distinguish. It's not a question of being wrong, but we we probably need to evolve our our community uh, definitions with what we are seeing in in in, in the landscape. And I think that you know, we all think that that is evolving. Anyone wants to jump in, or uh, otherwise, I have another question. Uh, it's very highly voted, and it, 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 anyone can answer this one. Uh, how do uh, do you think botnet developers uh, debug their software? Like uh, software engineering is really hard. I don't know if you've tried making malware before. Uh, I, I sure did, and it's it's true that it's it's kind of a a pain to debug. We have the same like malware authors have the same problems as any software engineer problems. Um, and do you think they, they do debugging in your experience? And the, how how good are they with the, the quality of their software? <laughs> so I, I will answer this, at least from a, our point of view of the Kashmir Black Botnet. And so, we do think that they are like actual developers. We saw a lot of uh, mainly Python scripts, and we can assume that the uh, attackers or hackers behind this botnet actually have development environment, and they even debugging their code. Uh, they can do that uh, like inside the, uh, some environment that representing like, uh, I don't know, a CNC, staging CNC, you can call it, and testing bots and stuff like this. Um, also, they can test it against uh, the, the production infrastructure. They don't have to have all the environment uh, in staging. Um, and I think that's it. I think they also use like PyCharm and IntelliJ. Like they are developers for like like all others. And they need to check that their code actually works. <laughs> yes, malware is hard. Like it's it's very hard, right? Even shitty malware is hard. Like crime war stuff, especially. So I don't know how much reversing everybody on the call does, but I I hate reversing crime war samples because their the obfuscation that generally comes with them is much more advanced and much more thorough than you get in some of the best APT actor malwares as well. It's yeah, they're actually they're some of them are great. They're they are geniuses. There is no doubt about that. Um they're in their own field of work unfortunately, but some of them are geniuses. Anyone else want to comment on this one? Uh, I just want to say something. I believe that there are a couple of I believe there are a couple of stories where the developers have infected themselves, infected themselves, and then someone found their information when they somehow get access to their control panels. So that's my. That's also a couple of stories that that, that I've seen on, on some presentations. So I guess they tested on themselves sometimes. Yeah, and maybe, maybe maybe I can add. I mean, uh, I come more from the study of you know online listed markets, and some of these markets are going to have you know hundreds of thousands of participants. And at that point, you're managing you know so many connections. You have to have you know your development server, your staging, your production servers. Uh, these markets have to also handle cryptocurrencies, encryption. So it's pretty impressive kind of what they're developing and the number of people that they have to service on every single day is pretty impressive. And I'm um, not sure how much I'm supposed to talk about this, but you know, I saw kind of the, the, uh, the map of the server the infrastructure, sort of these big you know, dark web markets. And it is pretty impressive just to see how it's connected from all over the world, how many servers they have for dedicated tasks, even you know, for communications between the administrators and clearly these people, you know, know what they're doing. But at the same time, if you've been around the dark web a little bit, you also see kind of one of the, you know, the, the worst website you haven't seen since, you know, 1994. It seems like they're kind of frozen in time. But there is there is some impressive work being done there with all of these technologies uh, combined together. So, uh, yeah, there, there is definitely some, some good, bad threat actors, if you want. 
Thank you, David. Uh, while I have you, uh, there's a question uh, for you. Um, well, anyone can answer it, but I think you may be the, the right person. Is how long does it take for an actual button infection uh, to be listed on the marketplace? Like there's the moment where a computer gets compromised, and then someone probably manually uh, assess its value and then add it to the marketplace. Do you have an idea about how much time it takes? So I, I saw the question. I was just looking in the case of you know Genesis Market, the the, the market I talked about in my talk. Uh, you have botnets that have you have bots that have been infected today, and that have been updated today that are for sale. So basically, our guess is that it's all automated. They end up in there. All their credentials are kind of organized and presented nicely in the uh, in the platform. And it seems like the turnaround is pretty quick. So a matter of hours probably between the infection. And you know they're only giving you access to the information, so there's no you know encrypting terabytes of data, which can take quite some time. So in this case, it's pretty quick, and this makes it one of the the biggest problem. In this case, is because you know the buyers are looking for new bots that were just infected, and so kind of if you get infected, the time you have to protect yourself appears to be quite limited. Um, but then if no one buys your bot, then and it stays there for a while. You're kind of in not such a bad position, but it's kind of the the first days are kind of the, the the critical days you have to go through and hope not to get victimized, basically. Yeah, that's pretty quick. Like hours, is, uh, they, they 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 must be like someone almost not twenty four seven. Of course, they must be sleeping, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if they have shifts or <laughs> yeah. probably. I mean, there are organizations like like you know work. Uh, organization, right? So, um, let me see. Um, there was one for uh, about the um, uh, academic software for Sam, um, and it, it, it was if you looked into the the, exam, the software for doing exams, um, did you also look into those kind of software or? That the, 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 because perhaps they, they, they want to verify that, you know, the person behind the, the keyboard yeah. is actually the student and not, so they must be like perhaps overprivileged to get that information. Uh, so I can really see why this could, um, this, this would make it uh, uh, this, uh, a door for other kind of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we we definitely threw that idea around. Um, uh, sometimes we get to, you know, play uh, a little bit more on our like our side that we want to choose targets based on what we like. Um, and, and one of the guys on our team um, thought that that software is kind of uh, overreaching, especially now everyone's taking exams from home. There was there's been some some articles where people uh, like have failed their exams because they like looked away for too long. And some people think like that, you know, with your eyes. So it was one guy wanted to look at those, but um, we, we actually uh, kind of looked around on the different kind of schooling softwares and kind of realized that a lot of those are like cloud-based. And when you're doing security research offensively, cloud-based research gets a little iffy because, um, we're then doing stuff over the internet onto remote servers and and uh, you know production systems. And if we granted, we're we're trying to do it in the interest of of good and to like you know disclose anything we find to these vendors. However, you know if we still drop all in their database or whatever, like that, that's not good. So we 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 try to. Kind of steer away from the uh, the cloud-based products as much as we can, um, unless we get uh, privilege beforehand. So a lot of the times we we choose a target, and we only disclose to the vendor that we're looking at it if we found a vulnerability or after the fact. Um, yeah, a few times people have reached out to us to actually look at things, and um, so in that case we would have probably had to reach out to them um, to the the exam proctoring uh, company and and uh, they have the full right to just say no we don't need to look at it and you know like things like that so um it was a, a, a an idea and a, a good target 
However, we, we decided to focus on something that would be installed kind of on the machine um, that we could uh, look at with um, from more angles. Definitely. Um, I have a, a broader question. So we have um, the, um, uh, a lot of the malware that we looked at today uh, is uh, targeted to the endpoint. Uh, except for the first one, which is server-side uh, malware, where there's uh, WordPress uh, being compromised and so on. Um, do you think we lack visibility into those server-side malware compared to the uh, Windows or endpoint uh, uh, software? And do you think that there, there are more server-side malware uh, than we think there there is? Does anyone else want to take that? I don't know if I'm the most qualified for that, that question. Anyone. Okay. Or I can give another question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, I can try to uh, answer. But, so for for one, yeah, it kind of goes back to the the debugging things. For for me, I know that um, trying to design things, you know, to exploit software and whatnot, it's it's easier to set up an environment on it uh, as an endpoint than a server um kind of hitting back on that previous question so for me designing malware i guess um i usually try to do endpoints first um and there's usually more of them but then also you know the server i guess has it, it, it's called yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a good question but uh I, I don't know about the 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 numbers though. Um, that's just kind of from my experience uh, being an offensive researcher. Um, so yeah. I, I don't think that anyone can say something about numbers, you know. But uh, for servers, uh, so there are a lot of uh, Linux servers that, for example, using um, Linux, so they have installed Python by default. Uh, it's like increasing the attack surface and we, we could see it in, in our research that they just use um, pre-installed stuff that they know that uh, uh, coming installed by default. Uh, Perl, Python, uh, specifically version 2.7, which is not supported anymore. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, so basically, interpreters are are sort of a a, a problem because of their uh, you know they can execute code and it's, it makes very portable code as well, I guess, because a lot of the servers run like different operating systems. But if you use Perl or or Python, you know that it's going to run pretty much anywhere. Yeah, exactly. I think you find as well, a lot of people assume that their servers are safer because they're in different environments, so they don't worry so much about them. Obviously, inherently, that's totally wrong, and they're not, but maybe that's why we get a lack of visibility sometimes. Like, I know I've worked in organizations before where they won't have things like endpoints or AV on large, this is a large financial company I store for, they won't have AV on it because it's not worth their while. It's not worth the criticality of the nature of that production server, which I totally understand and totally get, but... Yeah, that does mean obviously as a, as a threat research team, you do start to lack visibility on that side. I think from a, a WordPress and a, a web server point of view, I think we've got mass visibility and that on, on whole, like across all the companies that we see because any major server side malware, like it's based on WordPress, for example, it's generally fixed or looked at fairly quickly. Obviously, we have guys like Sam doing hardcore offensive research on these things and finding them, publishing them and releasing them and letting people know. So it, it doesn't always rely on the, a single competitor or a single, um, a single uh, vendor's endpoint either as well. We've got great guys like Sam and, and some of the other people that, are, that have talked throughout today as well who are, who are doing work on that stuff to try and push forward the community as well, which I think is really important. It's really critical. Yeah, I agree. So the, there's, I think there, the, my question is, was, was someone biased? I agree, yeah, some <laughs> uh, idea about it, but uh, I think you're right. I mean, there, there, we underestimate the number of server side threats that are there. That are there, and you know we spend less. I think the the whole industry is spending less 
uh, resources into looking into those those threats. Um, we have five uh, more minutes, um, and um, we are all. As I was looking at the different presentation, we're all like private. Uh, uh, privately held companies. We we are not public services or anything, uh, and I, I I know it's been discussed uh, a lot before, but uh, I, I still think it's it's interesting to bring up is the question of whether attribution is is important or interesting for for our industry. It makes a lot of uh, good stories, uh, perhaps, uh, which is which is uh, very nice. Uh, but uh, does it really matter uh, where those the, the attacks or where malware is developed, where they're operated? Um, I'm going to use that last five minutes to discuss that. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I'll go first. <laughs> I, I, I will just start by saying attribution is a, is a mud hole. That's that's the the, princi the basic principle that we need to start from. Now that being said, uh, I do believe that it matters. Uh, it matters. Maybe not specifically who's behind, but it matters for you to attribute a campaign to a certain group because that will that would allow you to profile the group. The next step, which is most of the times the one that everyone wants, is who is behind that group, and there I think is where it may have be there may exist some doubt if it's important or not. Uh, but of course, if you know who's behind that group, maybe you will understand a little bit better their motivations. So, in a certain in a certain aspect, it will be important. But it's it it's uh, it's it's not just about technology. It's about technology. It's about uh, a lot of other information that you need to understand in order to to do proper proper um, proper attribution. And sometimes you just don't get that information as private. As you start by saying, we are a lot, all of us are private companies, and we need to acknowledge the point where sometimes we just don't have enough information in order to make attribution. We may, you, we may be able to align it into a certain group or a certain spectrum, but you may not be able to actually, we may not have all the whole information to attribute it to a specific group or a specific country. And on the other, on the other hand, the non-privates. Organizations that may do it may not provide you with, you with the information to double check that. And whenever we talk about attribution, we need to live with that fact that we just don't have the whole information to do it. And hence, it will be on one side maybe biased, on the other side, it may be completely wrong because it's incomplete. I think you also need to think about it as, as an industry what, like, what do we achieve from it? Ultimately, we all work for companies, whether it be McAfee or Imperva or Talos, whoever we work for, we all work for companies to protect our users. That is why we all do the job that we do. I'm pretty certain and confident that if I went to my neighbor next door and asked him if he cared who installed malware on his computer, would that make a difference? He'd probably look at me and go, I don't care. Can you fix it so it stops stealing my money? And, and that is the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal for us as technologists and, and within this research industry is to stop those people getting compromised. Now, the flip of that from probably a, a much higher level here is attribution is important because as Vitor said, we want to track it and we want to understand TPTs that relate to actors that we as an industry care about. But Dave down the street has no notion of caring if it's country A, country B, or whoever you want to call out or, or whatever. I think again, and I, I know I briefly touched on this, I think journalism has played a part in this being a whole game as well that attribution has suddenly become important. I know for a fact that I can't go and kick a door down and arrest anybody. Like if I knew Sam was building the biggest malware botnet in the world that David was about to buy on some underground forum, I know who they are, but I can't go and kick their doors down and arrest them or do anything about it. So in reality, as an industry, I think attribution is not really important directly uh, to what we all want to do. But if I was to work for, say, a, a large state organization, I would probably have access to the human and SIGIN technology that I require to be able to do that final stage of attribution. It doesn't matter if I can relate malware A to malware B and say that they're the same actor, because that doesn't tell me who it is. But ultimately, I personally think that as an industry, we shouldn't care. We're there to try and sort of protect our users and ensure that we try and get rid of these dredges of society from the internet. Now, if we can work with law enforcement to direct them to someone, 
awesome. Let law enforcement go and do the job that they need to do. If maybe I can just add, just to finish us off, just a few seconds. But you know, this is where my my background in criminology kind of gives provides me with a very different answer. But you know, we understand by now pretty well how you become an offender, like you know, school connections with deviant peers and their, uh, and stuff like that. But with you know, hackers, uh, with online crime as well, we have a very poor understanding of how you go down that path and kind of what your criminal career is going to look like. And that's one of the thing I think that having attribution, understanding who these people are, what their story is, is really important because you know the goal of criminology is going to be to do prevention and to prevent people from getting there. And, and, and when you're looking at you know nation states, these people are going to be enrolled, they're going to be paid for this. Uh, sometimes it's some patriotic duty, so it's kind of a different case. But in terms of for-profit hackers, I think there's much research that needs to look into how do you turn into these hackers. And then how can we deploy, you know, these prevention programs so that people don't end up doing that in the end? So by knowing who these people are, I think is extremely important. Um, and there can be some fundamental research that can lead to programs that can be implemented uh, everywhere around the globe. Thank you, David, for providing a, like a different view. Uh, the Sam and, and Sarit, do you want to comment or no? <laughs> That's fine. I, I don't have anything to say, but I, I really like the, the. I agreed with both of you guys. Uh, <laughs> fully, that was great. Yeah. All right, great. So um, thank you very much for your all your presence and uh, very good presentations.